you may have you may have wondered why I kept uh, verbally saying that we would repeat repeatedly solve these problems and make t bigger and bigger and bigger. Why is that necessary at all? We've already proved that if you have the solution to the problem uh, minimize t f x plus phi x subject to a x equals b, then that's at most m over t suboptimal to my original problem. Right? We've gone through the proof of that using the KKT conditions. Um, so why don't we just pick, if you want to get you know, uh, 10 to the minus 8 uh, suboptimality guarantee on your solution, that's what you wanted for epsilon. And why don't I just set epsilon so that um, m over t is equal to, so why don't I set t so that m over t is equal to epsilon, solve this problem once, and declare victory. Right? In that case, I would take t to be equal to m over epsilon. Right? Because then, then my guarantee, m over t, for suboptimality would just simply be epsilon. So that's like going to this picture. That's the equivalent of going to this picture and saying, I'm going to try to directly seek out a solution very close to x star by making t very big. Forget about the central path. I'm going to aim directly for the end of the central path. So while that may seem like a good idea in principle, it works very poorly in practice. It's because there's serious numerical problems with doing this. Um, you, you require t to be very, very large in order for this to be true. right? And because you are not starting necessarily anywhere close to optimality, you don't really know where to start. Uh, it's not like you can start your Newton's method off at any point, point that's close to the end of the central path you know, by luck, just to begin with. This causes serious numerical issues. So people never really ever do this in practice. In fact, I don't know of any software implementations you can find that just set t to be very large and try to solve that particular barrier penalized problem to get an approximate solution to this to the original problem. Okay, a much better approach is to traverse the entire central path. And the reason that's, that's a good approach intuitively is that when, uh, let's say when t is reasonably small, this problem is very smooth. I'm adding actually a log function with not a huge multiplier to it, or not a tiny multiplier to it, if I think about it like 1 over t. It's fairly smooth. So Newton's method is being applied to a fairly smooth problem. I can converge pretty quickly. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make t larger, which means that I'm going to basically, if I think about 1 over t multiplying phi, I'm making that part less smooth, a little more like the indicator. And so I'm solving a little less smooth problem. Um, but I'm going to start this, the, those iterations, those new iterations, where I solved, where I finished at my solution for the previous value of t. That's called warm starting. And I'm going to solve that problem again. And hopefully, because I've started in a good spot, even though this term is less smooth, I'm going to converge quickly. Then I'm going to make t even bigger, which means I'm going to make this term even less smooth. It's you know, an even better approximation to the indicator function. And I'll do it again. But because I'm going to start uh, at the solution to the previous value of t, I'm already in a pretty good spot. So in other words, pictorially, maybe I go to this next slide, we're going to be staying fairly close to the central path. And that's going to be very helpful in order to, to get to this uh, extreme point rather than just directly seeking out an extreme point to begin with. And kind of an interesting uh, maybe interlude is that this reminds me, when I first saw, learned interpoint point methods, to what people do in kind of a, you know, regularization path programming, where it's a completely separate context. Here t has no meaning statistically, right? It's a parameter that we introduced. It wasn't part of the original problem. It came from some hard inequality constraints. But at a very high level, it reminds me of what people do when we talk about solution paths to problems over tuning parameter choices. So for example, let's suppose I want to solve the lasso or the SVM problem over many choices of their tuning parameter. We do a similar strategy involving warm starts for the same reasons. It's better to do that. It's more efficient to do that than it is just to try to seek out a solution at one extreme end of the regularization path. And I don't know of any formal connections between these two. I haven't seen any work that formally connects the central path in interior point methods to solution paths in statistical programs. But I think that there is one at a high level that exists there. Um, you know, maybe this connection needs to be further developed. So in case that piqued your interest, maybe you could, you, you yourself could look into that. So here's the method we're going to use. Um, it's called the barrier method. And it basically solves this problem repeatedly and makes t larger at each step and uses warm starts. That's the entire thing. And it uses Newton's method to solve that problem. So just said more formally, we're going to pick some initial value of the barrier parameter. Um, or I guess, sorry, I called mu the barrier parameter. Let's just call t. We're going to pick some initial value of t, call it t0. And we're going to solve this problem with Newton's method. 
So just a single problem with equality constraints with Newton's method. Then we're going to call x0 the solution to that problem. We're going to define a barrier parameter mu. This is going to be the amount by which we multiply t at each step. And we're going to repeat the following steps. We're going to solve, um, did I say where we defined t1? I guess I didn't say where we defined t1. We just take t1 to be equal to mu times t0. We multiply our current value of t by mu. We solve the barrier problem, say, at t1 using Newton's method. And we're going to start Newton's method off at x0, so at the solution we found when t was t0. And we're going to uh, produce a new, a new estimate of the solution, right, which we're going to call xk. Um, we're going to check whether or not the duality gap that we see, m over t, is smaller than or equal to epsilon, which is our stopping criterion. If it is, we're going to quit and say that we have an, a, a solution with a guaranteed um, suboptimality amount epsilon. Otherwise, we're just going to update t and go back to the first step. We're going to, again, solve the barrier problem with Newton's method. So this is a very nice method. I think it combines many elements that we've learned in the course so far. This is a, a bona fide duality gap. So we're going to be actually stopping here with a guarantee that the, the estimate we produce is within epsilon of the optimal, that achieves the criterion value within epsilon of the optimal one. Um, it combines a, a pretty fancy method we've seen in the inner loop, which is Newton's method with uh, equality constraints. That's this step here. And it also has an interesting connection to duality. That's how we got the, um, basically that's how we got this duality gap. It's also how we uh, interpreted um, the iterates via the KKT conditions. So I think, I think the barrier method is kind of a nice combination of various things we've learned so far. We often call, by the way, we call this the centering step because it brings us back onto the central path or close to the central path. Okay. So uh, it's, it's more that the iterations here, so each time, the, the reason that we do this for the most part is that each time that we apply Noon's method, that we run a centering step, we require far few iterations because we've started at a good spot. So let's suppose I wanted you to solve the barrier problem with parameter 10 million. I wanted, I wanted the solution to the barrier problem with parameter 10 million. If you tried to apply Newton's method from an arbitrary feasible point that satisfied AX equals B on the one hand, and on the other hand, you, you started the barrier problem off with T equals 10, multiplied it by 10, multiplied it by 10, multiplied it by 10, and used Newton's method each time, you'd be much better off with the second routine because you require a few iterations to converge early on because the problem's more smooth. And each time you solve the problem, you go to the next value of T, and you're in a good spot when you initialize. Um, when you initialize Newton's method. So in other words, you are the, the, the idea of the barrier method is to always remain in the quadratically convergent phase of Newton. So we know that Newton's method converges very quickly when you're in the high, when you're in kind of a close neighborhood of the solution. And the barrier method is designed to keep you in that neighborhood so that you hopefully always remain in the quadratically convergence phase. There's not a number of iterations that you need to take in order to get you there, which would be the case if you just had a very large parameter T that you tried to solve the problem with. In this way, can we make sure that the TFX and phi x, they are, they are of the same order, uh, approximately same large? Well, they're definitely not going to be that at, at optimality, right? I mean, eventually, you're saying when t is very large? Yes. No, so this is not something where we tune these two terms to be of equal size. I mean, eventually we want the 5x to have negligible contribution because we want it to basically be 0 on the feasible set, and we're going to be in the feasible set. But at the beginning, right, at the beginning when t is small, both of these are going to be sizable, and both of these are going to be smooth, and that's to our advantage. Yeah. Um, so are you asking in the context of this method or just separately? Uh, separately. So if I had, e if I had an, an inequality constrained problem, yeah. could I just do gradient descent and check whether the next iterate was feasible, you're saying? Yeah. Take a small enough step size that it's feasible? Uh, yeah, I don't know that's always going to work, right? Because sometimes you, if you're on the boundary, for example, of the constraint set, 
then no matter how, what size step you take, you'll always leave it. So that's why we use projected gradient descent. So you take a step, and then you have to project back onto the constraint set. So an interesting distinction that we'll get to in two lectures from now is that projected Newton's method does not work generically. So some people, when they learn um, kind of first order methods and they go to second order methods, the, the way you learn to deal with constraint sets in first order methods is to project on the constraint set. You take an update and you project back. It, and then you might think, oh, I'll just do it with Newton's method. I'll just take the update that it gives me, and then I'll project back. That generically is not going to work. So the projected Newton method does not converge for general inequality constraints. You have to be very careful in order to get that to work. Um, and we will just hint at that in two lectures and describe uh, a framework that allows you to see that that's not quite the right thing to do. And at the end of the class, I might talk about projected Newton method, some fixes for it, for specialized cases. But this is, this is really the, the kind of standard way to handle inequality constraints with second order methods. It's to, to add barrier terms. Good questions. Any other questions? OK, um, so there's some considerations here, right? Uh, choice of mu. Mu is, I guess, what I call the barrier parameter in the notes. If mu is too small, then um, you might need many outer iterations, right? Because if you're not updating t fast enough, then uh, you might need many steps along the central path in order to get to where you are, right? So I might just make very small incremental progress among the central path if mu is too small. If mu is too big, then I might need many inner iterations. Right? Newton's method itself might require too many iterations to converge because I've tried to solve a problem that's substantially different from the one that I'm, I've currently solved because I've made t a lot bigger. If I multiply t by 10,000 each time, then even though I'm trying to warm start my Newton's method, the warm start might be actually pretty far from where its solution is eventually. So that's going to mean that Newton's method requires many iterations to converge. Right? The extreme to making mu too big is just to making mu uh, big enough that you go right to the end of the central path. So this, is, this kind of logic should make sense from what we just discussed. Um, there's also the consideration of the choice of t0. right? How are you going to start the barrier method? And it's, uh, it's you know, almost a similar story. If t0 is too small, then you might need too many outer iterations because you've started quite far from, say, a big value of t, which is where the solution, which is what would have gotten you close to the solution. And if t0 is, is too big, then the very first time you compute uh, x0 via Noon's method, so the very first centering step, that might require too many iterations. Right? You might just exhaust a bunch of iterations trying to solve the very first problem if you make t0 itself too big. So fortunately, uh, in practice, this is just a you know, heuristic statement. There's nothing formal about this. The performance of the Berry method is often quite robust to the choices of these parameters. So um, there's a few plots I'll show from the Boyd and Vandenberg textbook to kind of empirically validate that, but it doesn't really matter, especially mu. It doesn't really matter where you, how, how you choose mu. On the order of 10 is fine. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that the, order, that the appropriate range for these parameters is itself scale dependent. So if I multiplied all of my constraints by a million, and I just defined my constraints functions differently, then that would, that would uh, change the meaning of these parameters. Right? So it is scale dependent. But on a standard scale, like if you're looking at, uh, you know, maybe say standard functions um, that take values on the, on the order of tens or hundreds, choice, a choice of mu about 10 is perfectly fine. That should do just fine. So here's an example just to um, convince you that mu doesn't matter too much. I, I took this example from uh, the Boyd and Vandenberg textbook. And it's using the Barry method to solve a small LP with 50 variables and 100 inequality constraints. And these are the number of um, Newton iterations that are required, cumulative Newton iterations. So you know, I might apply 10 Newton iterations in, in one uh, step of the Berry method, and then 12 in the other. And so I'm adding up the cumulative Newton iterations here. And I'm tracking the duality gap. And you can see that when mu is 2, so I'm doubling the, the, the parameter t at each step, I make pretty consistent fast progress. This is a, a log scale, right? This duality gap's in a log scale. When mu is 50, I make faster progress. When mu is 150, I make slightly slower progress. But these aren't drastic. The, the differences between these methods aren't drastic. This is all displaying uh, what looks like a linear convergence rate, right? Because this is a log, 
a log scale for the y-axis. Okay, and you can see you can see exactly here what we were talking about. Look at the the length of these steps. That's going to indicate how many Newton iterations were required in every inner step of the Berry method. And when mu is small, these are very small. So the steps go down very they, they're very short steps. That's because um, I'm solving a Newton problem. I'm solving a problem with Newton's method that's very close to the problem I just solved, just with the barrier with the parameter t multiplied by two. So by warm starting, I'm pretty close to its solution. So I only require, it looks like maybe on the order of four or five Newton iterations each time. Now when mu is 150, it looks like maybe I require about ten, between 10 and 15 iterations for every uh, centering step right, with Newton's method. That's because the problem I'm solving is pretty different from the problem I just solved. So the warm start isn't that close to the solution because the, the value of t has been multiplied by 150. So let's uh, discuss the convergence analysis for the Berry method. Um, the convergence analysis is done. So the Boyd and Vandenberg textbook has a little bit on convergence analysis for the Berry method. It has nothing on primal dual and chair point methods. And if you're interested in, in kind of very precise convergence analyses for those two, then I, I gave a reference to a, a monograph that was written by Nestroff and Nemrovsky on interior point methods, where they have very thorough, precise analyses for interior point methods. So Nestroff and Nemrovsky were kind of two um, founding fathers, in some sense, of interior point methods. And I'll discuss history a bit next time. But they have a, a monograph that gives a ton of detail. So if you're interested in more precise statements, go to their monograph rather than the Boyd and Vandenberg textbook. Um, but here's a very, very easy statement. Let's suppose that we can solve the centering steps exactly. So every time you apply Newton's method, you get a perfect solution. Okay, obviously, I, it's I, you know, an ideal world, and you, uh, you won't see that with Newton's method. But let's just suppose that was the case. Then just by nature of the fact that we multiply t by mu each time, and the duality gap is m over t, this is the duality gap that we see after k iterations. Right? m over tk, which is mu, mu mu to the k times t0. Okay, So unraveled, that's saying that um, to reach a desired level of accuracy epsilon, we require on the order of 1 over epsilon, log 1 over epsilon centering steps. So in terms of outer iterations, if we could do the centering steps perfectly, we would see a linear convergence in the outer iterations, log of 1 over epsilon. Okay, So this is not a real analysis. This is about the level that, uh, well, I, know I think Boyd and Vandenberg give a bit more details than this, but I want to simplify it even further and just say, just say this. Um, but you could make this more rigorous in a few ways, right? If you think that Newton's, Newton's method converges in a handful of iterations, once it's in the quadratically convergence phase, because log log 1 over epsilon is almost essentially a constant, um, or it's negligible consider, uh, when you compare it to log of 1 over epsilon, then outer iterations and total iterations are about the same. Right, because you're only contributing a constant number, say, in every, um, in every inner iteration in total when you apply Newton's method. And so that would take care of the fact that this is only counting out iterations, not cumulative iterations. And how about now uh, exact centering? Well, um, that's also not reasonable. We can't really assume that every Newton's uh, method step gives us the exact solution to the barrier problem. but. Uh, with a careful analysis, which is what Nestroff and Nemrovsky do, you can show that basically by starting by uh, increasing the parameter t in this multiplicative fashion and starting Newton's method off with a warm start, you pretty much always enter the quadratically convergence phase. So you can get as, as, as a small or a, as a fine degree of accuracy as you require in log log one of reps on iterations. And so in total, the convergence rate that you would see for like a real convergence rate for the interior point methods is really a linear rate. It's log of 1 over epsilon under the standard conditions. OK, so that's, I guess, the takeaway to have in your mind. If we have Newton's method on a problem with no inequality constraints, then it's a quadratic convergence rate. But once we apply interior point methods, it converges more like a, a linear convergence rate, so log of 1 over epsilon. OK, so we've, we've sacrificed something because we have to solve a sequence of problems. But at the same time, we've just greatly expanded the class of problems that we can apply Newton's method to. Right, now, we, now we can handle any kind of inequality constraints, as long as inequality constraint functions are smooth. Questions about that? Yeah. So 
I'm sorry? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, no, Newton's method alone is not going to take you to an infeasible point because of the barrier function. Right? A as you approach infeasibility, this barrier function is going to approach infinity. So Newton's method wouldn't do that because that can't be the minimum of, it, of its inner problem. But you have to be careful how you start this method. Um, you have to make sure you start it at, at a strictly feasible point. And we will talk about that just now. Yes, well, so remember, if we apply Newton's method with backtracking, then we're explicitly checking for a decrease in the criterion. So we're checking that we can decrease the criterion compared to, say, its linear approximation by an amount, you know, whatever the alpha parameters in backtracking. Now, if you were ever at an infeasible point, that criterion would be infinite because of the appearance of phi. So you would never exit backtracking, right? So it's going gonna, it's gonna to make sure you stay within the feasible region. A big difference is, is primal dual interior point methods, which don't provide that uh, check implicitly, so you have to check it explicitly, which we'll talk about next time. But it's a good question. So um, let's get to uh, just starting off here in tier point methods. So this is something we also didn't, you, I maybe also sweeped under the rug. I said, oh, let's just start at a point that has this property. It's strictly feasible. It satisfies all the inequality constraints strictly and the equality constraints. That's not trivial, right? That itself requires um, some work to do. And when you do your homework, this next homework, we're going to have you guys implement a barrier method for a linear program. It's not trivial just to find a, 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 you know, a point x that satisfies a bunch of uh, linear equality constraints and linear inequality constraints. That itself requires some work. So just to st start off, the barrier method, you, you require what's called a feasibility method. And the Boyd and Vandenberg textbook calls this phase one, and it calls solving the actual problem phase two. Okay, so it's, this is like what you should have in mind if you're going to apply the Barry method in practice. So the goal is to find a strictly feasible point. How do we find such a strictly feasible point? Um, it may sound circular, but we set up another problem that's called a feasibility problem, and we solve that with the Barry method. That's typically how people do it. I mean, people also use primal dual and shared point methods, which are a different class of, of, prob of uh, op algorithms that we'll learn next time. But if you're talking about the Barry method, we typically use um, a feasibility method to begin with. So we start off by proposing the following problem. We have two parameters now, optimization parameters, x and s, or two variables, sets of variables, x and s. And we want to solve the following problem. Minimize s subject to hi of x is less than or equal to s, and a x is equal to b. And if we could find that s was negative at the solution, <clears throat> then we'd have a, a strictly feasible point. Right? That would do it. As long as s is negative at the solution, that implies that hi of x is strictly less than 0, because it's less than or equal to s, which itself is strictly less than 0. And it satisfies the equality constraints. So we can go ahead and we can apply um, the Berry method starting at that particular point, the one that solved this problem. OK, so um, solving this problem is called running a feasibility program to begin with, or it's a phase one method, according to the Boyd and Vandenberg textbook. And I claim that we can do it with the, the Barry method. And it's actually quite easy. It's not nearly as hard as our original problem. Why is that? Well, there's two reasons. The first is that finding a strictly feasible, so f to run the Barry method on this problem, we need a strictly feasible point. right? But that's actually trivial. It's very easy to do that. All I need to do is take any x that satisfies the equality constraints. Okay, So not trivial. I need to find solve a linear system to find x that, that satisfies the equality constraints. And then just evaluate hi of x for all the inequality constraint functions hi. And take s to be, let's say, 1.1 times all of them. Or just the biggest hi of x you know, plus 0.1. Whatever I need to make this satisfied strictly. Okay, that, that inequality strictly. Okay, so just to write it down, I might solve ax equals b and then define s to be equal to the max of hi of x over all i plus 0 0.01. OK, there you go. That's a, that's a strictly feasible point now for this problem. It satisfies the inequality constraint strictly. And so I can run a Barry method starting from this value of s and this value of x. And I can repeat the steps that you learned for the Barry method, but it's applied to this problem. OK, 
Okay, so the, the criterion just gets modified by the barrier function for this inequality constraint. And the reason why it's also easy is I don't actually need to solve this problem to optimality. As soon as I find that s is negative, I can quit. Okay, so I don't actually care about the optimal value of this program. I just care about finding an x and an s pair such that s is negative. So typically, we just solve a linear system, define s in some way like this, and iterate this until we find that s is negative, and then we quit, which we could be quite far from the solution when we do so. That gives us our feasibility point, and then we apply the Berry method to our original problem. OK, um, the alternative is to solve this problem. There's another uh, feasibility problem that you could write down, which is uh, this one. So basically, instead of having a global parameter for every constraint, I have a local parameter for every constraint. And the advantage to this is that um, if the system was infeasible, then it tells you which constraints couldn't be satisfied strictly, because we now have a local variable defined for every inequality constraint. The disadvantage is that it's just maybe slightly more complicated to solve. Yeah, Kevin. I didn't understand the question, sorry. So what you mean is that if, if I have hi of x is equal to 0 at the solution, then I will find that it's, yeah. It's the right direction, though, right? I mean, so. So that's my constraint. And if you're saying that at the solution, even if this was supposed to be tight, it's not because of the interior point method? Well, it's still the right direction. It's still going to be strictly negative. <clears throat> that, I mean, Kevin brought up a point, which is that the, uh, let's suppose that at, at, this, at the solution to this problem, I should, I should be seeing some of these uh, hi of x is equal to 0. And with an interior point method, I won't see that. I'll see that they're very small. And as I make the barrier parameter larger, they get closer and closer to zero. That's true. That, that is a, a property of interior point methods. Um, but that's, I mean, the same can be said almost for any method we've learned so far. All the methods we've learned so far are iterative methods or indirect methods. So they just, they don't always have, um, say, exact zeros in places where they should. Now, proje a projection might take care of that. If you did projected gradient, it might actually take care of that, depending on how you do the projection, of course. But um, almost all the methods we've learned in class, right, they kind of have this property. So some exceptions, well, we, we may see an exception near the end of the course for some of the advanced methods. Any other questions? OK, so um, we will come back and do the primal dual interior point method on Thursday.